Welcome, my name is Kevin Featherstone and I'm a professor here in the European Institute at the London School of Economics. Today we ask Brexit, how is it for you? But our focus tonight is on what the rest of Europe made of Brexit. Um, through all of the dramas, political dramas, intrigue in London over many years, how was Brexit seen across the continents? Did they think we're mad? or did it make them reconsider their own EU uh, membership? One of the most notable exports to the rest of Europe in recent decades, of course, has been Euroscepticism. But Euroscepticism has varied and taken many different forms across different European uh, member states. It's been linked to the rise of populism, to the Euro crisis, and to the response to the unprecedented migration. Does Brexit connect with any of these uh, dimensions? Today's discussion is part of a, lecture, uh, a public lecture series uh, hosted by the London School of Economics and the National Bank of Greece. As director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE, I'm delighted to have this uh, collaboration. The lecture series has addressed uh, many important international uh, issues, and we've brought together senior LSE academics and senior figures from Greece to discuss the implications of these different international challenges. Today, we'll be making particular reference uh, to Greece uh, in the discussion uh, that follows. Of course, normally these lectures would take place in Athens and speaking to you from London, I much prefer uh, the idea that I would be in Athens uh, chairing this event but we've adapted uh, to the uh, pandemic restrictions and we take the opportunities provided by an online um, broadcast. Let me welcome each of you, and um, particularly those who are watching us uh, from Greece and especially our Alumni Association uh, in Greece. Uh, we work very closely with the Alumni Association and we look forward to that uh, continuing. Our main speaker today, is my colleague, Professor Sarah Hobart from the Department of Government at the LSE. Sarah holds the Sutherland Chair in European Institutions, which is named after Sir Peter Sutherland, the former EU Commissioner. Previously, Sarah has held posts at the University of Oxford and the University of Michigan. She is currently the Chair of the European Election Studies Project, an EU-wide research project studying voters, candidates and the media in European parliamentary elections. Sara has published extensively on elections, referendums, public opinion, and European Union politics. She's the author of many books and articles in these areas, and she's a fellow of the British Academy here in the UK. We're delighted uh, to have her with us. As a discussant, we're also very pleased to welcome Professor Sophia, Sophia Vasilopoulou, uh, from the University of York. Sophia has long studied varieties of Euroscepticism across the European Union. Indeed, some years ago, I had the pleasure of supervising her PhD on this topic uh, at the London School of Economics. Sophia's research uh, now examines political dissatisfaction with democracy and democratic institutions uh, across Europe. Her foci are Euroscepticism, extremism, and the loss of faith in traditional politics. Sophia currently leads an ESRC Future Leaders uh, project entitled Euroscepticism, Dimensions, Causes and Consequences in Times of Crisis. She's a perfect discussant for our topic uh, today, therefore. So we have two excellent uh, speakers. And before we start, I'd very much like to welcome the new chairman of the National Bank of Greece, uh, Gikas Hadouvelis, uh, to say a few words of welcome. Let me say that Gikas is himself uh, a professor of finance and economics at the University of Piraeus. Uh, he's previously worked in government, serving as Greece's uh, Minister of Finance in 2014. Uh, today, he's also the first deputy chairman of EOV in Athens, a highly respected think tank uh, translated as the Foundation for Economic and Industrial Research. Professor Hadouvelis 
uh, has a PhD from Berkeley and a master's uh, from Harvard. Uh, clearly, he hasn't been held back by not being alum an alumnus of the London School of Economics. But can I uh, invite Gikas to say a few words of welcome. Uh, Gika, over to you. Uh, you're muted, I think, at the moment. I'm sorry. Uh, I said thank you, particularly for the fact that uh, you don't consider me a second class citizen because I have <laughs> not graduated from LSC. Anyway, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome everybody, uh, especially uh, our speakers, uh, Sarah and the discussion, Sophia. Uh, I expect uh, to, to hear an exciting uh, debate on a very important topic. Um, uh, LSE and NBG for the past three years have uh, hosted this uh, lecture series. We had about 10 of them. And in fact, half were after COVID started. The last lecture that I participated, I remember, uh, was here in, in Athens. And it was given by uh, your director, the LSE director, uh, Dame Minouche uh, Shafiq. Uh, and it was very popular, I remember. Um, I'm very happy you're all, uh, you're all here with us. Uh, I expect uh, this uh, joint effort, which uh, sort of joins uh, two civilizations, two countries, and two communities, the academic community and the general public, uh, it provides a lesson and provides a, a convergence of ideas and a lesson to everybody, to the whole world, of how ideas can converge and how we can actually uh, promote knowledge uh, uh, among our citizens. Uh, so uh, I will uh, let, uh, uh, I will give the floor back to Kevin to, to organize it, this. And I hope to see you again in future lecture series. Thank you very much indeed, excellence. Uh, before we do begin, can I just make one or two organizational uh, points? Uh, we invite our audience to share their comments with us on Twitter and we suggest the hashtag, uh, hashtag LSE Brexit. Uh, and we invite those of you uh, watching to send us your uh, questions. You can use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screens. If you're watching us on Facebook, you can send us your questions using the comment uh, facility. As your chair, can I ask you please to keep the questions short so I can read them easily from the side of my screen and get through as many as, uh, as possible. Also, let me say that uh, today's discussion is being recorded and all being well, we hope to make it available as a podcast uh, in the next couple of days on the LSE uh, websites and also uh, particularly from the LSE Hellenic Observatory uh, websites. So we've got a great topic and we've got excellent speakers uh, let me therefore invite my colleague Sarah Hobart uh, to get us underway. Sarah. Thank you so much, Kevin. I mean, it's a great honor to be giving uh, a talk in this lecture th series, the Hellenic Observative Observatory Athens lecture series. And of course, thank you to the Hellenic Observatory and to the National Bank of Greece for making this possible. And I'm also delighted to be sharing this Zoom stage, not quite an and stage in Athens, but the Zoom stage with such a distinguished uh, group of scholars. So tonight's topic, as you've heard, is Brexit. Uh, but unlike what I normally do, I'm not going to talk about Brexit and the effect on these British Isles I'm sitting on. Rather, I will talk about how it has affected citizens across the EU and specifically how it has affected how they look at EU membership. So I am going to share my screen with you now to share some, uh, some particular data and some particular evidence that I have collected uh, on this topic. And let's first cast our mind back to the 24th of June, uh, 2016. Uh, certainly if you are here in the UK, this is a moment, uh, a day you will, or a night that you will never forget. Um, but also throughout Europe, this, um, this moment was one that many uh, remembered and that came as a surprise to many. It came as such a surprise that the newspapers, as you will see here with the Daily Mirror, a British uh, tabloid newspaper, had to have two front pages. The first early edition was one where they thought Remain 
uh, would win the day and it would be Project Reunite. And the second was one where, as you can see, the 5 a.m. edition, Britain voted to leave the EU. Now, this referendum decision sends shockwaves through Europe. But the question is, what kind of shockwaves were they? I've given you two illustrations here. You can see the illustrations on the left, which is one where that really illustrates the Brexit deterrent, the UK walking the plank into uncertain waters that are shark infested. And you can see the other illustration on the right. Here we see Britain as a more positive example to be emulated, where we are sailing uh, on this British ship into the beautiful sunset, whereas what we are leaving behind is a sinking ship that is the EU. So what has been the effect of Brexit on public support for membership in the rest, um, in the remaining member state? That's really what I wanted to look at in our talk this evening. And if we first think about why there was such nervousness, such anxiety on the 24th of June across the capitals uh, of the EU, that's of course because the Euroscepticism skepticism is not something that's an isolated British phenomenon. We know that from all EU member states. And really, in particular in recent years, what we've seen is that Eurosceptic parties such as Le the Lega uh, and the Five Star Movement have been in government in, in Italy. We've had um, Le Pen's, Le Pen coming number two in the, in the French presidential election. So Euroscepticism is really a phenomenon that was widespread. And as Kevin Featherstone pointed out, often closely connected with the rise of populism across Europe. And indeed, what happened in the immediate aftermath of Brexit was an example of just that this movement took Brexit as an impetus to say, well, first Brexit, and then, as you will see here in the poster, you can see there in the poster from France, and now France. So we had Frexit, Nexit, Italexis, talks about all sorts of different exits. And there was a lot of nervousness. Was this going to be some kind of domino effect where one country after the other would fall? Now, there are also reasons, however, to think that, in fact, Brexit was much more of a deterrent because it didn't look like the whole process of leaving the U European Union was quite as smooth as some had hoped or some, uh, some on the leave side in the UK had hoped. And I want to give you just two illustrations of that. On the left, you see the British pound exchange rate against the euro. And this shows an illustration of just how the markets responded. And as you can see, the market responded very negatively to the decision of Brexit and continued to. On the right, you have an assessment, Walter and Martini, two scholars that coded uh, the responses, uh, um, newspaper responses on whether Brexit negotiations were going positively or negatively from a British perspective. And you can see anything above one would be that this is positively from a British perspective and anything uh, anything above zero and anything below zero, anything negative would be mainly negative perceptions of how the Brexit negotiations were going. And as you can see, it's mainly in the negative, it's in the red. So what happened for this to, to be perceived so negatively? Well, let's just take a very quick glance at the turbulent years of, that followed this momentous decision in June 2016. As you might recall, the British Prime Minister Cameron resigned almost immediately, and the new Prime Minister Theresa May came in and triggered Article 50 to start the negotiations. These negotiations were then put on hold when our Prime Minister Theresa May decided to hold British, uh, British general elections. Then in 2018, uh, the withdrawal agreement was published and approved by the EU. However, while this was negotiated by the British government, it was not approved by the British parliament. And this led uh, the British prime minister to ask not once, but twice for an extension of article 50. This was granted, but the conservative government uh, suffered in opinion polls. There were European parliament elections and Theresa May had to resign after very poor result, a very poor showing. What followed then was that Boris Johnson became prime minister. So we are now already on our third prime minister uh, in the post-Brexit era. And he then announced that, well, parliament was not playing ball. So he was going to prorogue uh, the House of Commons parliament, i.e. close it down for a time. Uh, that was declared unlawful by our Supreme Court. 
um, and Brexit, the Brexit deadline had to be extended for a third time. So you can see this was looking rather chaotic uh, from a perspective of the parliament. Now there was another general election where the slogan was that one the day, get Brexit done. Boris Johnson had negotiated a new deal. He won the election with a large majority. Finally, the withdrawal agreement was agreed in 2020 by parliament and Britain left the European Union. There was also a UK EU trade deal. And you might think Brexit got done, everything was plain sailing. But even now, uh, in October 2021, we're sitting here and the UK government very recently proposed an entirely new Northern Ireland protocol, which was of course a core part of the withdrawal agreement. In other words, the deal that this government had negotiated is still not, uh, is still not fully consensual, problems still arise. So Brexit might have been done, but it is not over. So that is how many on the continent indeed saw these Brexit negotiations unfold and what we lived through in the United Kingdom. How did attitudes, how did citizens' perspective on EU membership evolve in response to these many events? Just summarize them very briefly here. Well, in the UK, and I promise not to talk too much about the UK, but in the UK, as we'll see here, Opinions remain very stable. If anything, this is a question that asks citizens, do you think it was right or wrong for Britain to decide to leave the European Union? And you can see the green here is wrong, i.e. those who think it would have been better if Britain had stayed in the European Union. And you can see they have a small um, majority uh, now in polls, but nonetheless, it's very stable and the country remains very divided even today. What about in EU 27? Um, one of the questions that have been asked over time in, uh, in Eurobarometer surveys is a question of whether EU membership is a good thing, a bad thing, or neither. And what we can see that after June 2016, there seemed to be an increase in those people who thought it was a good thing. Um, and, and some have suggested, well, it might partly be this Brexit deterrent. Now, of course, other things also happened in that period. We came out of a long, prolonged uh, financial and Eurozone sovereign debt crisis, and things were looking up generally. So that might also have contributed to this uh, more positive buoyant view of EU membership. So let's look a bit closer at why it might be that Brexit, the fact that one member state left the European Union, could have influenced people's opinions uh, on membership positively in the EU 27. So the argument I will uh, propose to you uh, today is that Brexit acted as a sort of benchmark, uh, a yardstick for membership support in EU 27. Let's take a step back and think, why might that be? How do citizens form opinions on EU membership? Well, one way in which they do is a sort of cost benefit analysis. Are we better off inside or outside the EU? Does it actually benefit us in a number of ways? And to inform this assessment, citizens take cue from national elites, you know, the party, the government they normally support, they rely on their own identities and predisposition. But what they also do, I would argue, is they compare the idea of being in the European Union, which is what they experience in every day, with the alternative state of not being a member. So they, it's not only how great is membership right now, but it's also what might it look like if we were not in the EU, if we left the EU? Would things be better or worse then? And this is an argument put forward uh, by, uh, most prominently by Catherine de Vries, who wrote a book on this benchmarking argument. Now, why might Brexit then work as this kind of benchmark? Well, of course, what it did is it showed people, well, this is what it looks like, at least for Britain, when they try to leave the European Union. Um, in a sense, this was the alternative state that was presented there uh, to citizens of the EU 27. And if that then was perceived negatively, like chaotically turbulent, then uh, my argument would be that would increase support for the EU domestically because they would think, well, if that's how it is for Britain, this might be a similar experience that we would have if we were to leave the EU. 
On the other hand, you can argue that if Brexit is uh, perceived as being a success, then support for the EU would um, decline within member states uh, because they would think, well, actually, we might also be able to go it alone. So therefore, break the, this Brexit benchmark would not be fixed, but might change over time as our perceptions of how well Brexit is going changes. So what I'm going to show you some evidence for are these sort of simple uh, propositions, which is that people who think that Britain's exit from the European Union um, have negative consequences for Britain will also be more supportive of their own country's membership of the EU. And this will particularly uh, be the case for people in countries that were more exposed to the economic consequences of Brexit. One reason for this is that they will take a greater interest in what happens uh, with the European Union, uh, with uh, Britain's exit from the European Union. So let's just first take a quick look at what these perceptions of uh, Brexit consequences were across Europe. And uh, for those uh, very eagle-eyed observers out there from Greece, you will see uh, that Greek uh, take a pride spot at the very last position where they're very balanced in perceptions of whether or not the UK was in fact, would be worse off or better off outside, um, outside the EU. And you can see in general though, the overwhelming consensus in EU 27 was, among citizens in EU 27 was that the UK would be worse off outside, uh, outside the EU. Again, Greece is the only example of a country, uh, of a member state that thought that was balanced in those views. You can see even in the UK at the time of this survey, uh, 2019, more people thought the UK would be worse off than better off. And that's still the case, in fact, today, if, if you conduct polling in the UK. Now, that would again lead me to think that at this time, at this snapshot, that means that there was, in fact, um, a negative uh, perception of Brexit amongst most people. And what I'm arguing is that for those people who viewed this negatively, that would also affect their own support for EU membership of their own country. So what we're looking at here in terms of what I'm looking at to, to sort of predict is EU membership support. And let's look at it in two ways. Let's look at this question about whether EU membership is a good thing or a bad thing, but let's also look at what people would vote in a referendum. So in a hypothetical referendum of their own country on EU membership. And that's the, the black uh, line here. And as you can see, there's not a single country, uh, sorry, that's the light gray line, that's, that's uh, the vote intention. As you can see, there's not a single country where over 50% um, of the population in this survey would vote, uh, would vote not vote to remain, even the UK here is slightly over. But this, the, the other ones that are close are the Czech Republic and Sweden and Italy, and even those countries not anywhere close to 50%. So it does look like in EU 27 at the time, there was not a, a big desire to leave uh, the European Union. But did Brexit affect this support? And, and this is a graph that, 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 that basically illustrate the results of a statistical model where we look at the effect of Brexit perception. Was Brexit, would Brexit leave Britain worse off or better off on EU support? And we can see on the left-hand side that those who thought the UK would be will be better off outside were overwhelmingly um, were much more likely to um, to not think that EU membership was a good thing. On the other hand, if you thought the UK would be worse off, you're overwhelmingly likely to to think that EU membership is a good thing. So there is a very strong relationship between your perceptions of how well the UK will be doing and your own support. Uh, for EU membership of your own country. Similarly, with the effect of the referendum, um, uh, with, with your hypothetical referendum vote, if you thought the UK will be worse off, then you're much more likely to say you'll vote remain. Of course, we don't necessarily know the direction of that relationship, but nonetheless, it shows that there's a very strong relationship between perceptions of Brexit for the UK and your own EU support. These perceptions, this relationship was much stronger, in fact, in countries that were more economically exposed to Brexit, as I argued. Now, another mechanism that shows that Brexit had an impact uh, on how 
people in EU27 thought about membership is if we look at how parties responded, um, parties responded to Brexit. And here I rely on some excellent research done uh, in the European Institute by Tom Hunter, who was a PhD student in the European Institute, who analyzed hundreds of parliamentary speeches um, by challenger parties across Europe, i.e. not government parties, but challenger parties that were normally more Eurosceptic and saw how their strategy in talking about Europe changed before and after the referendum. And what this quite colorful graph shows you that before the referendum, many challenger parties, Eurosceptic parties would, would advocate an exit strategy. In other words, say our country should follow the UK, we should have a referendum, we should be on our way out. That's the dark purple as you see on the left. What happened after the referendum that that strategy was only adopted by very few challenger parties across Europe. Instead, they would adopt what some have called a soft Eurosceptic approach. We want to reform the EU from within. And that's what we see if we look at parties like Le Pen's National Rally and other parties, the whole agenda of saying, we're going to take the UK and we're going to take our country out of the EU has become much less prominent in the debate across the continent. What has happened instead is saying, well, we're still going to be critical of the EU, but we're going to change it from within. And some of that can be argued was partly in response to what was seen as Brexit not being a success for the UK. So why would you want to follow in those footsteps? Now that's the Brexit benchmark as it is now after turbulent years of negotiations. But one question I wanted to ask is, can that change? Is that necessarily stable? And there is some suggestions, as we've seen recently here from February 2021, so February this year, that perhaps people might, that events could happen where people might look more positively at Brexit. And, and this is sort of a, a fun little uh, tabloid newspaper interaction between the the, the German tabloid newspaper Bild and the British tabloid newspaper The Sun. And uh, now I'll do my best German translation in the British, um, uh, in, the, in the Bild, they say, we envy you, oh dear Brits, we envy you. Why did they envy the Brits? You might ask yourself, well, at this point, uh, the Brits were ahead in the vaccine rollout uh, of their continental uh, neighbors. Uh, it's no longer the case, I think, but that was the case in February, 2021. And the Sun responded, and they had a little picture there, as you can see, of Merkel and Boris Johnson. We don't envy you over the EU vaccine shambles. Now, many in Britain, especially those on the Brexit side, might uh, attribute the vaccine, successful vaccine rollout in the beginning in Britain to exactly Brexit. Well, whether that's right or wrong, it can be discussed, but it illustrates that it could be uh, hypothetically that in, there are scenarios in which Britain even in a country like Germany, as you see, this was on the front page of a German newspaper, was seen in a much more positive light. And some of that uh, could be attributed to, to Britain's new status outside the European Union. So this suggests that this Brexit benchmark in the future might be a dynamic one rather than one that always uh, presents itself as a deterrent of leaving the European Union. Instead, it might be that if Brexit becomes, let's say, uh, a roaring, if Britain becomes a roaring economic success, uh, then it could be that people in uh, that Eurosceptic movements on the continent will use this um, as an impetus for their own, uh, their own movement, their own desire, their own motive to, to leave the European Union. Now, that's, of course, a hypothetical. Yeah, so it's very hard to test. So to get close to this, what we did was to try and give people some information about how the UK was doing um, in terms of what the cost and benefits uh, of Brexit was to the UK. And then she did that shift, either negatively or positively, people's view of their own membership's EU support. Um, so we ran this cross-national vignette experiment. Vignette simply means you give people uh, a bit of text, uh, some information about something, and we randomly assigned that to citizens in all EU 27 member states. And then we saw what is the effect on people's support for EU membership in their own country. 
And we had a sort of positive Brexit information. And we took this from the campaigns from the Brexit referendum and thought, what is the most positive, what is the most prevalent positive messages from the Leave campaign? And what is the most prevalent negative messages from the Remain campaign? And from the Leave campaign, we took this that Britain leaving the EU will mean that Britain will have more control over its own laws, including controlling immigration, which was, of course, a very prominent theme in the Brexit Leave campaign. On the negative side, we said, um, we, we took a prominent theme from the Remain campaign was Britain leaving the EU is expected to reduce growth and may lead to economic recession in Britain. And we had a group that didn't receive any information. Now, what was the effect of this on citizens' view on membership support? And what we can see here is the Brexit benchmark didn't have any effect. Uh, the negative where you said it will reduce, uh, it might reduce economic growth, but the positive Brexit benchmark uh, did have quite a significant substantial effect on reducing support for the EU, i.e. increasing your skepticism. Now we think perhaps that the lack of effect of the negative benchmark has to do with um, has to do with the fact that it was already at the time 2019 when we ran this kind of factored in. People had already heard so much about the negative economic consequences that it wasn't really uh, very much new, uh, whereas uh, talking positively about Brexit was far less widespread, so that would have had a greater effect. But that's obviously a speculation. So um, in conclusion, what I've tried to argue here is that in the short term, we could see that far from Brexit being a beacon, an example to be emulated in the short term across the EU27, it was a deterrent rather than contagion. Most people in the EU27 are still pessimistic about the prospect of Britain outside the EU, and that is associated with their own higher support for membership. Now, that has also had an effect on the whole EU debate across the EU27, where the parties that are normally Eurosceptic have adjusted their positions and fewer are now directly advocating an EU exit. But what I also suggested is this is not necessarily something that will remain the same forever. You could imagine that the UK status as an emeritus member state could either remain a deterrent, but could also, in cases where the UK is seen as a more successful emeritus member state, be a more of an inspiration for Eurosceptic movements in the future. So I'll leave it there and I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sara, very much. Uh, that was very nice and, and clear. Let's go straight to our discussants. Uh, Sophia. Hi. Um, so, well, first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, delighted that I'm here and that I um, can share some of my thoughts. Um, I mean, I'm a great fan of Sarah's work and um, I genuinely think that her work has improved our understanding of European politics. Um, I've got a couple of thoughts or questions so that we can start the conversation that relate to kind of the general comparative data that we've seen and the findings. And then I'm just going to share a couple of ideas or thoughts on Greece in particular, uh, considering that this is um, a lecture um, that has that, that is sponsored by the Hellenic Observatory and the National Bank of Greece, um, and it has a specific audience. So um, let me start from the kind of the general points. Um, I really enjoy um, the vignette experiment. I think this is excellent work, really interesting. And I, I one particular um, aspect of it that I enjoyed was that um, the frames that individuals were exposed to were essentially realistic, right? Because these are the kind of stuff that we have heard and seen um, in the news, they were not kind of coming out from a box. Um, I just want to hear a little bit more kind of your thoughts in terms of how come uh, one frame was more sort of efficient, had much more effect than the other. Is it something, in a speculative way, we can start the conversation, right? Why sovereignty? Um, why, the, why does the um, a frame on sovereignty has a greater effect um, or has an effect 
uh, whereas the, the frame on the economy doesn't. And it's kind of interesting because kind of going back to Brexit, um, the economic frame that was used primarily by the Remain campaign actually did not have an effect or as much of an effect on the Brexit outcome. So I just want to kind of pick your thoughts on that. And uh, one sort of idea I had is that obviously the economic frame is a hypothetical frame or is a much more of a hypothetical frame compared to the sovereignty uh, frame in the sense that people are less like, if, if people are exposed to the idea that um, Brexit or, or means more control over your laws, this is less uh, likely to be disputed compared to, oh, it might have an X, Y, Z effect on me. So I just wanted to hear um, your thoughts. The other kind of interesting thing that I find is that um, the, the positive effect, the positive, uh, the frame that is that has a positive outlook on a positive tone has an effect. And that goes against a lot of theories um, that talk about negativity bias, that find that negative, negatively framed um, um, arguments tend to have effects. So perhaps it'd be nice to hear your thoughts on that. Um, now, a second question I had, which um, you have partly answered, but again, I just want to throw that um, in the conversation is, of course, effects are very hard to quantify. And as you also mentioned in your talk, um, it depends how these are framed by domestic politicians, be it the government, Eurosceptic entrepreneurs, so on and so forth. Um, but do you foresee Brexit having a long-term effect in people's views of the European Union and in people's uh, views of their own country's membership in the European Union? Um, or is it more a reflex or is it more a thermostatic kind of um, response? Um, what do you think is um, would be the response? And, and I'm saying that particularly because I feel that the effects of Brexit it have been quite intertwined with the effects of COVID. And this is the conversation here. We can, it's very hard to decouple the two. And, and I wonder whether European citizens can also decouple these kinds of things. So um, how would that work in your opinion? Um, now, my last point that I wanted to make relates to, to Greece and how uh, perhaps Greece um, would fit in this overall pattern that you talked about. And at this point, I would like to just briefly share some of my slides. Um, sorry, let me just um, share my screen. Um, yeah, so um, just to say a few things about Greece and um, kind of how Greeks view the European Union over time. Um, I mean, Greece has been a very peculiar case. It's been a case of very high levels of support um, of the European project over time, uh, which um, were quite often higher than the European Union average. And then we saw kind of during the crisis an abrupt change of attitudes towards the European Union, a, a very sharp decline um, of support in the European Union, which has shown some recovery, but essentially um, has recovery has not picked up as much as one might have expected after the crisis. Still, um, Greece is, in terms of the image that um, or, or, or um, Greeks uh, perceptions of the um, uh, European Union is quite low. Um, at the same time, Greece is a country where um, basically, for those of you with um, uh, good eyes, uh, Greece is on the kind of far uh, right, where we see that uh, trust in the European Union is very low, is actually the lowest um, across the European Union. Um, and one would say, say okay, maybe, trust in, Europe, in, in um, domestic institutions might be high, but actually what you see, 
and this is around the middle here, is that about 73% uh, um, percent of the Greek population actually do not trust their parliament. When it comes to domestic institutions, the pattern is very similar uh, with regards to the government and political parties and so on. So it looks like uh, Greece is essentially a country with kind of deep distrust in the system, uh, be it the national system, the domestic system, uh, be it in um, uh, the European system. Um, now, despite these very low levels of trust in both domestic and European systems, actually what you see is that surprisingly, the support, uh, the country supports uh, uh, the Economic and Monetary Union quite a lot. So Greece here is around in the middle with 81% of support of the EMU. So this presents a particularly contradictory attitude there. Um, and I'm saying that not because necessarily we want to explore and understand why this is the case, but in a way, how would a country that has suffered quite a lot from the crisis, one of the effects of the crisis has very strong distrust in politics, be it national or supranational, uh, uh, how would that country react to Brexit, essentially? Um, would they understand it as a deterrent or not? Um, I guess sort of perhaps one way of thinking about it is that um, Greece, um, this is the, the, of the situation of uh, their economy is quite negative. And perhaps that's kind of a way of thinking about that. So I guess what I'm trying to say, and when I want Sarah to just give us her view, is perhaps Greeks' understanding of leverage, right, would be very different to their perception of British um, um, politicians' leverage. Would they react the same? Or could it be whether there is contagion or deterrent, whether that would be better understood by a country that is much richer, let's say, much more comparable um, to the Euro to, to, to Britain, say countries like Denmark, Sweden, and so on. So um, I am going to leave it at that, and I'm looking forward to um, um, uh, Sarah's response. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, very much indeed. So um, perhaps it would be best uh, indeed to invite Sarah to respond to your various uh, points. Um, I think the first point that Sophia was making was about uh, the impact that you put into your experiments was uh, to do with economics uh, rather than uh, sovereignty. And Kevin, that... Kevin, could I start with the last one? I just thought now okay. we don't really have all the data fresh. I, I, okay. I, have, I haven't forgotten. I just think it's uh, wonderful that um, Sophia brings this uh, Greek perspective, and I, I do have a sort of a, something to say on how, how to link the, the argument about the Brexit benchmark to, to Greece, and, and I'm really happy she brought it up, and, and thank you, Sophia, you know, for all your, your, all your excellent comments. But just on Greece, and actually Greece is one of the examples that from a long before uh, the Brexit referendum let me think about this sort of benchmark or reference point argument in terms of how people make up their minds about how to think about membership. Because what I found so fascinating in Greece during the Eurozone crisis, where of course uh, many people in Greece uh, did not feel well treated, I think rightly, by the EU. And also, as you showed uh, in your graphs, there was a decline in the image of the EU. Um, in Greece uh, and general decline in trust. Um, at the same time, what we saw was that support for remaining in the Euro remained quite stable. And this at the time for me was a real puzzle. You know, how can you have this, for good reasons, decline in how the Greek perceived and then still quite stable support? And one of the things I arrived at, which is, I think, very similar to the sort of Brexit benchmarking argument, is that people sort of look at it relatively. They think, well, the EU, it's not great. They're not treating us uh, well. We don't have a lot of leverage, as you were pointing out in the negotiations. We're sort of a fait accompli we're being presented with here. But how would we fare outside? 
Yeah. So, and that's the sort of this alternative state. And I think a majority of Greek at the time thought, well, this is clearly not great at working out, but potentially it would be even worse outside. And I think that explains that, that puzzle. And it's very much the same. And this is also where, where Brexit becomes relevant because it gives many people in, in the remaining member states saying, well, how would we fare outside? Uh, maybe not so great if even Britain, this you know, fairly big member state can't uh, sort it out in a way that's successful. So I think there is a relationship. It's the same sort of comparative argument that, that explains why why in, in some member states you can in fact have quite negative as you, you saw in Greece, negative evaluations of the EU, but if they come together with quite negative evaluations of your own, uh, for example, your own state's capacity of doing it better, uh, then that leads to, uh, that doesn't lead to exit your skepticism. It might mean you want to change the EU, but you don't have exit your skepticism. That's one of the reasons I think we often see higher levels of exit your skepticism in northern member states, because they tend to have quite high levels of trust in, um, in their own government's capacity to do things better. Uh, uh, and therefore, when, when you have a kind of skepticism about the EU compared with thinking, well, our own uh, government, our own economy can go it quite well, then that leads you to think, oh, maybe this alternative state is not that bad. So I think that argument still applies. The UK, and you, you raised an interesting point, do, do the Greeks think that perhaps the Brits have more leverage? Probably uh, that's right. And also certainly the Brits have quite, and probably that also is grounded in sort of more long-term historical reasons, a very self-confident belief that they can go it alone with, with smaller economic repercussions, where I think what you find from smaller and more middle-sized member states they might be more nervous about the uncertainty of being on the outside, perhaps rightly so in a globalized economic uh, market than, than the Brits that you know, used to you know, be a big empire <laughs> and can therefore go it alone. So I think that, that how scared are we of that alternative state? How scared are we of these shark infested waters as opposed to the sovereignty? So, so I, I, I really think I, I'm happy for you that you brought up that Greek case. And I think it does show that you can have quite high levels of dissatisfaction with the EU. But if that's combined with a sort of a nervousness about going it alone and a nervousness about maybe your own nation state's ability to do it better, I think we find something similar often in, in Italy, for example, that even if they don't love the EU, they might not necessarily think their own politicians would necessarily do a better job. So, so thank you for that. And, and, and then, so I'm going sort of backwards in terms of your comments, in terms of the long-term effects that has, will Brexit continue to matter? Of course, Brexit will never matter as much as the Brits might think it does. You know, people are not quite as obsessed with Britain as, as we might be, uh, think they should be or are. Uh, uh, here in Britain. However, I think the question is not so much of the direct experience with Brexit on the continent. The, the question is much more, how can Brexit be used by these Eurosceptic movements that are clearly there? So will it be mobilized or not? And that's how I think it might continue to matter. At the moment, it's not in the interest of Eurosceptic parties or politicians like Le Pen to mobilize Brexit as an example of how great it would be for, let's say, France outside. But that could change, for example, if Britain ends up doing economically much better, or had it been that Britain had continued to do better in terms of COVID, which is, I guess, not the case if we look at infections and deaths. And, but had it been the case, then there might have been an incentive because these, what I like to call them, these political entrepreneurs will use something like Britain in that way. So I think that's more, and, and in that sense, Britain can continue to be brought back into the debate um, in, in continental Europe. Sarah, I wonder if I could just yes, of uh, ask you to expand a little bit more on that. That's, um, of course, you've emphasised that Brexit isn't a, um, a fixed point. It's a moving uh, target and perceptions may change over time. Do you think it would be primarily economic conditions uh, rather than anything else, which might lead other Europeans to, uh, to view it favourably? I think, no, that's a great question. And I, I, I did use the economic example, but no, certainly not. I think we just saw, you know, where it actually took off in, 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 Brit, in, in European newspapers, the comparison. Uh, and the one I mentioned in my talk was the vaccine rollout. I don't think anyone could have predicted that. Uh, but you could imagine another example. Let's say we have an inflow of, of um, 
of refugees uh, due to the situation, uh, you know, for example, in Afghanistan, not an unlikely future scenario. The fact that Britain, uh, Britain might be able to deal with that in a different way or, you know, independently, i.e. not taking any refugees, that could be an example where, uh, and let's say the EU decides some sort of burden sharing where in fact the EU is imposing as some member states receive refugees and their member state. Again, that's something that could be mobilized. Uh, it's an example of this is often one of the, the types of argument that's mobilized in opposition to EU membership uh, by your skeptic parties on the right. Um, the sovereignty of immigration. So no, I don't think it necessarily is the economy alone. And that in fact leads to, to, uh, um, to Sophia's final point, which is a very good one. I think why did one framework and not the other is sort of the smaller point. And then there's a bigger point of do we, can we say something about what arguments are more powerful? I mean, the, in making these frames, there was a trade-off between being able to make everything the same except positive and negative and go for realism. And as you said, I tried to go for, we tried to go for more realism. And that means also it's hard to know exactly why one didn't work and not the other. The reason we had to make the economy more hypothetical is we couldn't tell them, you know, the economy will shrink in the UK as a result of Brexit because, you know, that we don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it had to be, you know, most people expect that because that's what most people, most expert expected. But of course, it's it's ultimately uncertain. So you could argue that it's just a weaker frame. Another bigger thing is that we do see that in, in a lot of arguments, also why often the populist radical right does so well, appeals to the people against the establishment, appeals to sovereignty, appeals to self-rule tends to be quite successful. And that's not just in Britain, this idea that you, the people, you can decide yourself. You don't need some establishment, some elite. And, and that does seem to be popular. Of course, also the issue of immigration in one is one that's salient across Europe and not just in the UK. So in that sense, it's maybe not surprising that that frame did work, although it did come as a surprise to me that the economic frame didn't. Um, at the time, maybe perhaps a bit like the Remain campaign were a bit surprised they couldn't scare people into voting Remain by telling them it would be bad economically, you know. That then your final point was one about positivity and negativity. Studies have been made of the Brexit campaign that showed that the Leave campaign was far more positive. The Remain campaign was far more negative. And some people might say, you know, the, I know there's research as you referred to showing that negativity is good, but also there's research showing that you know, giving people hope, mobilizing enthusiasm. You know, you can think of, you know, President Obama or Macron with his own mask. These were hopeful change makers. And there was no hope or change making in the Remain campaign. And there was in the Leave campaign. And so that might be one lesson. You know, it's not all about inducing anxiety, but it's also about inspiring hope. And I think that in the British case, the Leave campaign did that more effectively. Thanks very much. Um, we have questions coming in. Uh, can I take the very first one because it picks up on the experiment which you made, uh, Sarah. And uh, there's a question uh, from S.Y. Chan um, in two parts. Who were the people in the European Union uh, that you surveyed? And uh, what were the number of people in each of the EU countries you interviewed for the survey? So just a, a basic description of how you did it, please. Yeah, so this was done by uh, you know, an international survey company. We you know, subcontracted them. I didn't personally talk to all 30,000 uh, <laughs> respondents, but, but what happens is you use a form of, of, of sampling that ensures that you have a nationally representative sample of the adult population in each of the 27, actually at the time, 28 member states. We also conducted it in the UK. Um, so uh, in each member state, about a thousand people uh, were surveyed. Thank you. So um, I'm going to take the questions simply in the way that they've uh, come in. So um, we're going to move from one topic to another. Um, and Marika Frankakis uh, says uh, there is an ongoing challenge to the supremacy of the EU law by Poland and to a certain extent by Germany. Could this be a factor that may be related to the Brexit debate or conflict? 
Yeah, I mean, of course, that's a very important uh, and very, you know, big challenge for the European Union right now. Interestingly, it's not necessarily um, driven by public Euroscepticism in Poland. Uh, if you look at uh, survey data on public support and support for membership in Poland, in fact, it's quite high. Um, this challenge that was brought, of course, by the Constitutional Tribunal in Poland, but ultimately this is a challenge brought by the Polish government that doesn't want the EU uh, to, to constrain the way in which the government is influencing the independence of the Polish uh, judiciary. So this is really a struggle here uh, between a Polish government um, and, uh, and the European Union that's trying to impose. And it's also a bigger question of, of liberal democratic norms and values and what many would see in Poland and also in Hungary as democratic backsliding in those member states and the extent to which and the degree to which the EU should interfere in that. Uh, and of course, Poland's view is here is they shouldn't and the EU is, you know, is thinking the extent to which they should. And so it's not so much a bottom up uh, Euroscepticism. This is not a sort of a demand. And we saw, in fact, of course, many polls coming out in demonstration in favor of, of EU membership. Uh, it's much more really a struggle between uh, a government that wants to not be constrained, not be lectured uh, by the European Union and a European Union that think that it's not just uh, the EU is not just about uh, a cooperation around economic integration. It's also founded on certain liberal democratic norms and values. And what do we do when we feel one member state is in breach of those? And that is a fundamental challenge to the EU, but in this case, I would say not one that is driven by, by citizen opposition to the EU. Well, I guess it raises the question whether Brexit was uh, bottom up or elite uh, led. Uh, and I wonder whether there is a parallel with what the Polish prime minister was saying in the European Parliament this week, which seems to be on the theme of take back control. Yes, I mean, uh... I've always argued that the desire to have a referendum, obviously the referendum itself and the voice there was very much the voice of the people, but the desire to have the referendum was bottom up rather, it was top down rather than bottom up. In other words, if you look at all the data on how salient, how important the issue of the EU was to the people uh, of the United Kingdom, this was not an issue they were particularly concerned with or cared about or sort of felt like this was something that had to be resolved in a referendum. Uh, instead, this was a decision of a, of, a, of a conservative leader and a conservative prime minister to decide to call this, I think, for much more party political and electoral strategic reasons. He, of course, campaigned in favor uh, of remaining in the European Union and ultimately lost it. So at that whole point, it did become the voice of the people. But I don't think it was sort of a strong desire that ultimately this had to come to, the, to a referendum. But then this was a long, intense debate, and it was one... And, and, the, and the feeling, the sort of soft US skepticism in the UK is not a new thing. I recently uh, did a study where I looked at just the last 40, 30, 40 years of, of US skepticism in Europe and also in the UK. And you can see that Britain has always been somewhat of an outlier, you know, with dynamics over time, but Britain has always been slightly more US skeptic, lower identification and passion for Europe and the European project. Than its continental members. So for a government then to go in and say, well, now you have a say, was always going to be, I think, particularly risky in the UK. Thank you. Question from Jonathan Little. Um, I just have one please do, here. Sophia, please do. Yes. I, I think um, just to, to add, um, the police case is quite interesting because as I said, this is government led and actually there has been opinion polls after this that show that the Polish people will overwhelmingly um, vote to stay in the European Union if uh, a referendum was held um, now. Um, from the point of view of Euroscepticism, however, and how the European Union addresses such challenges, it's potentially more problematic for the European Union to address the Polish challenge versus addressing the challenge from the United Kingdom. Because as soon as Brexit happened, essentially, the UK receives a status as an external. So already the country is dealt with very differently. Uh, Poland, on the other hand, is an EU member state that is trying to change the status quo 
from within the European. Okay. So in that sense, it's it's much more difficult to address this challenge uh, from the European Union's uh, point of view. Yes, it's a good point. One country wanted to leave the club. The other country is talking about a systemic uh, feature which they wish to uh, change. Uh, thank you. Um, Jonathan Little, the form or exits eventually chosen by the UK governments was an extremely hard one. The data presented related to other EU member states, but could any useful comparisons be gleaned by public perceptions of Brexit from people in the European economic area countries, uh, that is Norway, uh, Switzerland, uh, etc. Uh, do you think this has relevance for uh, the associated uh, member states of the European Union, Sara? Relevant for, for the UK or for the EU 27? Well, re relevant in terms of uh, encouraging more Eurosceptic attitudes. So uh, do you think uh, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, the rest of them became more Eurosceptic because of what they how they saw Brexit? No, again, I think also if we, to the extent that uh, we have data on it, it was also seen as a bit of a shambles how, uh, how things were negotiated in Britain. And uh, there's not necessarily, I should say, there's not a great desire uh, in the countries, you know, the debate on rejoining is not a particularly live one, uh, certainly not um, in Switzerland, but that doesn't mean that there's a desire to have quite, as, as, as the questioner rightly pointed out, quite as thin of a trade deal um, as the UK have negotiated, because of course the UK is rather an outlier when you compare with other um, member states that, that are not, in what, in other uh, European countries that are not in the EU. So no, it didn't lead to a sort of, oh, let's go for an even thinner trade deal, but there's also not a very live discussion on let's, let's now join the EU. Thanks very much. Uh, Sophia, I wonder if I can direct this question to you. Um, Greece is a country which did not wish to exit. This includes both the people and the political system. Uh, whilst Greece's partners, and especially Germany, would, be happy, would have been happy to see it go. It is an inverse place to be in by comparison to Brexit and the UK. I think that's more of a comment, really. But do you want to comment on the comments? Well, um, yes, why not? Um, I, I, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't comment on whether um, Germany would want uh, Greece to leave the European Union. Um, I'm not sure whether that is true or not. But I guess one thing to think about is that um, would people in Greece this will leave the European Union, partly influenced by what happens in Brexit or not. And here, considering um, issues about negative economic performance and so on, and distrust in domestic institutions, the answer is people might not want to leave the European Union or the EMU anyway. So if something happens in the UK, um, whether people perceive that actually the UK is going to do really well out of Brexit and based on Sarah's um, data actually that we have seen that uh, the Greeks think uh, in those terms whether this is going to make Greeks actually believe that they should leave the European Union I'm not I'm not sure and I think an interesting point to add to the discussion is that when we had the referendum in Greece a few years ago even those individuals um, who um, did not want to go with all the conditionality, there were polls afterwards uh, showing that essentially no one really thought that um, their response to the referendum would actually imply exit from the EMU. Uh, although in practical terms, if that was the government's choice, that would mean exit from the EMU. So it's rather interesting that even skepticism, backlash, and so on, actually in the people's hands and hearts and minds meant, okay, we're gonna stay in the European, in the, in the, in the Eurozone, which is, I think, rather puzzling in, in that sense. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, can I go to Amy Turner, a student here at the LSE, and she picks up, Sarah, on your uh, wider work about challenger parties in relation to uh, the European uh, issue. Uh, and she says, uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts uh, on the question of whether there 
is a particular stage when a challenger party or a new populist party transitions into being a new mainstream party. What might be the qualities necessary to be considered a mainstream party after originally being populist? How would we know the difference? Well, I mean, this classification we have many different classifications the one um i use in in my work uh with catherine de Ries, we, we wrote this book about the rise of challenger parties and we think a really distinguishing uh, feature there is really government experience and that also matters uh in relation to as you say kevin uh populism and also your skepticism because once you have government power it is just so much harder to say, well, uh, we are still going to be a challenger to the to the establishment. It's, it's much harder to to campaign um, as the outsider. It's much harder to say, well, we're going to uh, be against uh, this uh, European Union and change it because you actually have to be held accountable for what you do. And one interesting example is we did see, for example, when uh, the Five Star Movement and also Lega became a governing coalition in Italy, that uh, they had in part uh, campaigned on leaving not the EU, but the Euro, which would of course have been quite a big deal. And that was all of a sudden not much of an issue once they were in government. That's not to say that uh, they don't retain some of the same characteristics and campaigning slogan, but they couldn't quite adopt that sort of very uh, radical exit, EU exit uh, rhetoric once they were in government. Thanks, Sophia. I wonder if I can uh, put this question to you from Ali Um, And she's basically saying that, of course, the discussion here, uh, we've chosen the focus about uh, Brexit and the UK, as an impact on uh, EU attitude in other member states. But she's saying, what about uh, the perceptions of other countries that might uh, impact on um, attitudes? And she cites the case of, of Turkey uh, as, as one example. Um, let me uh, go to that. Uh, as influential benchmarks for EU support by providing examples of what it's like to be outside the European Union. So uh, I guess the, the question is asking, well, um, might other outside countries impact on attitudes towards uh, EU membership uh, by contrast to, to the UK? I'm not fully sure I follow the question. Well, it's basically <laughs> saying that, uh, basically saying what we've been discussing is whether Euroscepticism in EU member states has been impacted by the UK's experience. What about the experience of other countries who are outside the European Union? Uh, might they be impacted by uh, what life seems to be like in, in Turkey or elsewhere? Well, I th I think that it's, it's not as likely because I don't think the experience, I don't think people know these kinds of things as much. And I think one, way of sort of um, the population of one country being influenced by what happens in another country is how issues may be politicized in that country. So it's much less likely to see politicization and discussion of issues in countries that are even outside the European Union. Okay, uh, great. We have a question here, Sara, from Brazil. Of course we do, it's an LSE public event. Um, do you think that in some way Brexit uh, means that the inspiring hope promised by the pro-Brexit leaders showed that uh, they targeted the future in a scenario of an empire? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, let me interpret that uh, for you. Um, basically, uh, I think the question is whether the pro-Brexit support uh, was not only hopeful, but conjured up uh, a historical reference point of Britain having an empire and being um, able to be a bigger uh, country outside the European Union. So was it the weight of history that impacted on uh, British Euroscepticism in, the, in 2016? That's a good question. I mean, obviously also a difficult one. Certainly what we do know empirically that there might have been a certain nostalgia that were correlated with the Leave vote. In other words, if people think generally that Britain was better in the past, uh, they would be more likely to have voted to leave. 
and perhaps that was also you know a bit of parallels with with Donald Trump's make America great again this idea that Britain was so great I'm not saying that you know to be a leave voter you necessarily have to have sort of imperial uh, ambitions but just the uh, the sort of the idea that Britain could be even greater and also that perhaps in the past they were indeed Britain was better than now does seem to be yes correlated with um, with people wanting to leave the EU. Thank you. Frank Curtis. Um, could I add something? That's quite an interesting one. I, I mean um, it's quite interesting if you see what politicians say uh, quite a lot of um, frames that we have heard are about our discussions is about um, global Britain mm. and the status of the country as a global power in the world. Now that's very interesting because that general frame I think could be in interpreted in different ways. Some individuals could very well interpret it with reference to the past. So Britain as an imperial power with um, you know, um, strong links with many countries across the world, some other individuals might just simply interpret that economically without necessarily having any sort of identity, identity type of connotations. And I think perhaps that kind of tells us why this kind of frame has been quite successful uh, um, uh, and, and still remains quite prevalent in the government talking about global Britain, because you can speak to both those individuals that are thinking about the past, but also those individuals that are thinking about the future and, and how the UK's strong economic status in the world could help uh, its negotiations with the European Union and surely its negotiations uh, with other countries in terms of trade agreements. It's a very good uh, point. Of course, uh, many historians would say that uh, the UK moved to uh, apply to join the European Union in the beginning because of a sense of economic decline and the European integration uh, was seen as an option for uh, tackling the problem of uh, economic decline. Uh, whereas now the global Britain mantra uh, is a sense that actually we could do uh, better economically outside the European Union, if only somehow we're free of uh, EU regulation. Uh, we do have uh, quite a number of questions uh, to come in. So um, Frank Curtis uh, uh, asks, um, I'm sorry, the questions jump around on the screen, just as I'm about to read out. <laughs> um, Frank Curtis asks, um, uh, I think, uh, coming back to what uh, Sarah was saying about the significance of Brexit uh, as an impact on uh, how uh, others in Europe might see EU membership. Uh, how big a theme is Brexit to citizens in the existing member states? Is it marginal or significant? Uh, I remember that Brexit was daily headline news in the UK, but was much less prominent in other countries. Could we be looking at this from the wrong end of the telescope? In other words, it looks big to us in the UK, but could it be small at the other end where views are formed, whether for or against EU membership, by other factors? Sorry. No, that's that's a great question. And I mean, there's no doubt, of course, I don't think anyone would argue that Brexit is as big of a, as a, of a deal in the EU 27 as it is here in Britain. Of course not. But we do have uh, we have done research, uh, indeed, looking at the media across the EU to to try and gauge well, you know, did it matter at all? And there's quite solid evidence, less so now, but that during those turbulent years um, of the Brexit negotiation, this was indeed something that was covered not uniformly across um, the continent, but covered especially in those countries that were more economically exposed to Brexit. I mean, this was something that brought a lot of nervousness in smaller Scandinavian countries, for example, also in the Netherlands. And um, so it was this was something that was not, you know, the idea of a no deal uh, Brexit was something that brought a lot of nervousness. And on top of that, of course, there was the absolute spectacular, wonderful drama of the British House of Commons, which is uh, something you don't quite get. Uh, there's something else. I mean, Britain does rather um, 
it does ex is exceedingly well when it comes to sort of soft power and influence, partly due to the fact of the British lang English language. So people do follow uh, Britain a lot more than they might follow, uh, you know, a similar sized uh, other member states. So again, there was variation if we look at coverage across, but we do see that those events like the Brexit deal being uh, rejected in Parliament, uh, the election of Boris Johnson, and these things did, did receive coverage um, across across Europe, in particular in 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 the, uh, our more closer neighbours, Germany, Ireland, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and so on. Uh, and even uh, John Burkhub became a bit of a sort of pin up uh, on the continent. So, so yes, of course, it's less significant than, uh, of course, other things matter for support of EU membership. I don't think anyone would argue otherwise, but there was certainly an interest in uh, Brexit also, also in continental Europe. Thank you. And uh, perhaps I can put this question to both of you. It's from Mike Harvey of the Open University. Um, she actually addresses it directly to Sara, but let me also invite Sophia to respond as well. Uh, does Sara have any information about how the recent anti-Europe and nationalist rhetoric of the British Prime Minister is received across Europe? Um, how does Europe view uh, Boris Johnson's uh, Brexit uh, rhetoric? Uh, any, any data or impressions? I, I'm, I'm a bit curious about the word recent. I think, <laughs> uh, in the sense that, of course, Boris Johnson was, you know, one of the most prominent. Again, if we look at the data, the most prominent voice of the Leave campaign. Uh, the Leave campaign was one that used negative rhetoric about EU, and I think he is very much seen um, in that light. In other words, I don't think there is a sort of a, anything particularly unexpected about the way in which uh, sometimes, I don't know if it's the sort of recent um, debate over the Northern Ireland Protocol or what the particular question refers to. But in that sense, I think this is something that's already factored in, of course, both in how EU negotiators look at this current government, but also how generally Boris Johnson is seen um, to the extent that people have a view on him. I don't think these recent things are particularly surprising. Thanks. Uh, Sophia, how do you think uh, uh, the Greek media portrays Boris Johnson's rhetoric on Brexit? Uh, well, I think um, he's probably presented as a kind of an interesting case because uh, I think Greek media would not really expect what happened in Britain. And I think um, Boris Johnson is quite... Um, um, you know, it's a kind of personality that media quite like to report upon on because he has, you know, he makes nice, um, interesting comments or sometimes controversial comments and so on. But I think ultimately uh, for Greek media and I, I suspect for other media as well, you know, the UK has moved uh, to an outside kind of status. So I think that's also quite um, visible. Thanks. I wonder if I could uh, try to come right uh, up to date and uh, ask Sara about um, the political space that EU member states, EU member governments might have when it comes to Boris Johnson's uh, recent demands, uh, whether it's on the Northern Ireland Protocol or uh, fisheries, uh, etc. Uh, perhaps drawing on several questions that have uh, come in, to what extent do you think uh, public opinion uh, in France or uh, Germany or other EU member states could actually uh, constrain their governments to take a particular position on Brexit? Or actually, does the, do their governments have uh, much room for manoeuvre? That's a, it's a very good question and one that um, that uh, Professor Stephanie Walter at the University of Zurich has a project looking uh, more specifically at not EU support but indeed the negotiation preferences of of citizens across the EU, which is interesting and and sort of comes to this dilemma between on the one hand, you know, the harder you go in against uh, Britain, the less, the more likely it is, for example, you know, to be very frank, that we might end up with some kind of trade war if we can't get the the, the current controversy over the Northern Ireland 
protocol solved, though previously, of course, uh, in the debate on the withdrawal agreement and then on the trade deal. So that's the risk. But the other risk is also there, and that's where the dilemma comes in. The risk is if you go into soft, um, first of all, you know, you risk undermining some quite core principles uh, that the EU is built upon. You risk, in the case of Northern Ireland, compromising uh, the situation, the fragile situation in Northern Ireland. And also, I think what the EU has learned, and I think what the EU was quite pleased with in terms of the Brexit negotiation, not necessarily the outcome, I don't think this is the deal they would have most wanted, but I think what they were very pleased with is that they negotiated with a united front. The United Kingdom did not manage to divide the EU over the negotiation. They were quite successful in saying, this is our negotiation position. This is what you have to deal with. If you want this, you can get this and this. And so, and in that sense, I think the Brexit negotiation up until this point have been seen as a success in how it's been managed. And that means I think there's not an appetite for us now to go to a point where you have sort of bilateral talks, a bit with France, a bit with Germany about dealing with this. I think they have seen that this is to this point, this has worked. Britain is now exactly like Sophia also talks about, is this a third country? It is not an insider like Poland, where you need to massage, you need to deal with it in a way that doesn't, it's an outsider. And, and, and the EU has quite a lot of experience. The, it's a big outsider, it's an important one, but has a quite a lot of experience in trade negotiation and how, and is not afraid to use its muscles when it comes to international trade negotiations. And it's a big economic block. Of course, what makes this more complicated is the situation of Ireland and Northern Ireland. It's not just economics here, but I think nonetheless, in terms of having a united front. So I, I, so I don't think that the domestic public opinion is going to constrain uh, member states in terms of continuing the current negotiation line they've held. I don't think that's, that's, that's that is the issue they face. Thank you. I think we're coming to the end uh, here. Um, ah, this, let me pick up a colleague, uh, a question from uh, our colleague, uh, Valtrad Schelkel. Uh, what do we know about the effect of Brexit in terms of making EU citizens more positive, less negative, disposed to EU membership? In other words, a reverse of the domino effect, a feeling that the EU is better off without its awkward partner, the UK. So might it be that uh, EU support is increased uh, because the um, European Union looks rather more um, cohesive and united without the difficult uh, Brits being involved? And that's a great question. We did ask, ask about that. And I think this is much more, I know that you get certain Euro federalists uh, that shall be not be mentioned by name that sort of think, oh, maybe the silver lining of was this, that now we could finally sort of turbocharge uh, the EU federal project without these awkward Brits. If you ask citizens, you know, most people would have liked the UK to stay in the EU. I don't think there's any sort of thinking, oh, we're much better off without, that's not a general consensus. Most people would have liked the UK to stay in EU. I think UK is generally in Europe looked at quite fondly. And as, as we already discussed, they have a sort of a lot of cultural influence. You know, people watch British, you know, like British music, watch British television uh, programs and so on and British films. And I think, you know, it's never nice if you're in a club and someone wants to leave. The EU is used to people queuing up to join, not wanting to leave. So in that sense, I don't think there was a desire thinking, oh, we're much better off without them. That was not the general opinion. That is not to say, say the same as saying, now that you want to leave, we're gonna give you everything you want. That's also not the, sort of the consensus opinion in, among citizens in the remaining member states. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think we have come to the end of the uh, discussion. Uh, Brexit, of course, uh, has been at the top of the UK's uh, agenda, but as both uh, Sarah and Sophia have uh, outlined, it's also a, an agenda which impacts on other EU member states uh, very much and uh, has been a focus of much uh, attention. And Sarah's uh, presentation and Sophia's responses helped us to understand uh, that kind of interactive uh, dynamic uh, much better. 
Before uh, giving my thanks, can I just simply mention the next events, which is being organized by the uh, Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE. And that is part of the, this will be of particular interest to our viewers uh, in Greece. Um, part of the UK's program of celebration of the 200th anniversary of the outbreak of the Greek uh, revolution, which in the UK is uh, under the umbrella 21 in 21, 21 events in 2021 to commemorate uh, this anniversary. So on Thursday, the 28th of October, the 28th of October, uh, we have a panel discussion about the continuities and discontinuities in the geopolitics of Greece over the last uh, two centuries. And we have uh, very uh, good speakers to guide us. Konstantina Votiu is an associate professor at the University of the uh, Peloponnesus. Eric Goldstein, professor of international relations and history from Boston University. And Yorgos Pervalakis, professor emeritus of the Sorbonne University and permanent representative of Greece at the OECD. My colleague Spiros Economides will be chairing that, uh, that session. And that is 28th of October, UK time, uh, 1600, available again online for you to uh, join us. But can I thank uh, very much indeed our uh, speaker, Sarah Hobolt, our discussants, Sofia uh, Vasilopoulou, uh, for their excellent discussion. Thank you for your questions. And let me thank also our uh, National Bank of Greece and the collaboration that we have uh, between us. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Goodbye.